So in this lecture, we are going to continue discussing the discretization of the QCD action on the lattice and hopefully towards the end of the lecture discuss how does one in practice actually simulate uh, dynamical uh, QCD on the lattice. So uh, the last thing we discussed at the end of yesterday's lecture was um, the fact that uh, once we discretize the continuum action just with a naive discretization which would replace the continuum derivatives with a symmetric derivative, we ended up becoming, uh, we ended up having uh, instead of a single particle, so when we looked into the uh, naive fermionic propagator in this case, we obtained instead of single particle with a momentum uh, pi mu equals to zero, we actually saw that uh, looking at the poles of the propagator in the P4 plane, uh, that we actually obtain quite some uh, number of poles which one does not expect to have in the continuum. So basically we got nk times phi over a, where this nk can be either zero or one. And um, so this basically gives us um, an additional number of relativistic particles which are described by the, discretized, uh, by the Fermian action uh, discretized in such a naive way. And today we will see a way to overcome uh, this problem of so-called Fermion doubling. So basically, so this was a uh, time component, this, this, this were spatial component in the time direction. We also, because we, we said there is no difference between space and time dimensions uh, when we are working in Euclidean space time. Uh, just for convenience, we performed this analysis by looking into the infinite time dimension. So, um, so basically, uh, we get uh, the unwanted doublers in each of the four uh, space-time dimensions. So in total, instead of one relativistic particle, which was described with the QCD, uh, with the continuum version of the Fermion, free fermion action, in this case, we got 16 relativistic particles, which are known as fermion doublers. And um, the first idea how to actually uh, avoid having this doubling of uh, fermions in the discretized version of the fermion action was actually put forward already in 1974 in the article by Kenneth Wilson that I mentioned several times during these lectures, the confinement of quarks. And um, uh, the idea of Wilson was to add to the uh, to the fermion action, to the discretized fermion action in such a naive way that we've discussed yesterday, a term which looks like this. So some constant r times a divided by 2 and then add this uh, irrelevant operator to the action which has the same structure as the mass term uh, but is multiplied by the lattice spacing a. So backward derivative, forward derivative, again acting on uh, the our fer discretized fermion fields phi of x, which we said that are placed 
in the sides of our discretized space-time lattice. So if we add this term to the action, then uh, the naive fermionic propagator, which we've written uh, towards the end of yesterday's lecture, I will write it down again here. So we had sum over all four uh, space-time directions. I times this rescaled momentum pi mu, gamma mu plus, and then in the original, so in the naive, in, in the case of naive discretization of fermion action, we just had a mass term here, constant mass m0 times the delta function. And in case we add to our fermionic propagator this irrelevant operator, delta s, then this mass term uh, gets replaced with the momentum dependent term. We will denote this as m tilde of p, depends on the momenta. And this m tilde of p turns out to be the original mass term plus 1 over a times sum over all directions 1 minus cosine p mu tilde of alpha. So uh, cosine phi alpha. Yeah. So um, I won't go now into the details of the derivations. The derivation goes along the same lines as the one which we discussed yesterday for, uh, for naive fermions. So in order to be able to, to cover towards the end of the lecture some practicalities of, of simulating fermions, I'll just note that um, if we perform the analysis of the spatial two-point function, the sh in Shalene Lehmann representation, and I refer you to the book of Jan Smith that I've given you the reference to in the beginning of the first lecture for a full derivation of the uh, of the Shalene uh, Lehmann representation of the spatial two-point function in this case for Wilson fermions. And the short version of this derivation you can also find is in Luigi Del Debio's notes, again, that I've mentioned. Uh, from Vastep 2012 lecture notes. So what we get here in principle, is that instead of having uh, these 16 uh, relativistic particles which were described with a naive fermion action, in this case, our uh, energy of, if all the particle states are again numerated by alpha, as we had yesterday, then, uh, then the energy will be equal to the, in the case when we have this irrelevant operator added to our lattice discretized version of the action, a m0 plus 1 plus 2 times sum over all spatial direction n k of alpha. So this nk of alpha was the one which gave us the fermion uh, doubling. So in this case, as we said um, already also in the, in the scalar field theories, we know that in the continuum limit, so 
So if we take the limit where the spacing goes to 0, we know that a m0 also has to vanish. So from, from this, then since a m0 vanishes in this expression, if we take the continuum limit, then from that we know that limit of a times this energy for each multiparticle state that could in principle create it with this fermion discretization also has to vanish. So this, this vanishes actually only if this nk nk of alpha equals to zero. However, since the energy is now given with this modified expression, if we take the limit of the energy in lattice units uh, for nk equal to 1, then we get a finite expression on the right-hand side. And this tells us that former case where we were getting fermion doubles, doublers for nk uh, equal to 1. In this case here, um, the doublers are now suppressed all the way, uh, pushed all the way to the, uh, to the scale of the cutoff. Because then this energy of these particles, since limit of a times the energy is finite, is proportional to 1 over the lattice spacing, which is the energy of the cutoff. So basically, uh, by introducing this irrelevant operator and adding it to our discretized action, as proposed by Wilson, um, one uh, moves the unwanted uh, relativistic particles all the way to the scale of the cutoff, and one ends up with describing with a discretized fermion action on this single relativistic particle, as was our goal from the very beginning. So what is R and why does it pop up in, in this, in this delta S? So the extra what is R? Ah, all right. Why does it pop up in M2? Uh, okay, so uh, for convenience, so in this derivation we have set it to 1. But, uh, but in principle, one can play a little bit with this parameter in order to get different, uh, 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 different approaches to the continuum limit. But yeah, so, uh, so for these considerations here, it's set to 1. And in most implementations of Wilson action, it's also uh, set to 1. But uh, again, since, uh, since this is, as you can see, since this is an irrelevant operator, you can multiply it with any number because in the, as you go to the, as you take the continuum limit, this will uh, not affect your final physical result anyway. All right, thank you for this question. And now um, uh, let's discuss uh, rather briefly um, what was the, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of adding such a term? So this is not the only way to avoid, this is a way to avoid fermion doubling, so there are other ways um, in which one can also uh, remove these unwanting, unwanted uh, basically artifacts of our symmetric, uh, of our discretization of the continuum derivative and push them all the way to the scale of the cutoff. So this is the simplest one. Uh, this is the perhaps the main advantage. So this is the simplest way to get rid of the doubles. But um, uh, the disadvantage, okay. yes, please. Uh, so this term Uh, does it, does it break 
so it doesn't break gauge invariance, but uh, with a proper derivation of lattice derivatives uh, that we are going to discuss uh, in a moment. So, so for now, we're discussing still the, the free case, and, it's and, and then it's obvious that, that it's invariant under. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we are in the moment going to turn on the, the interaction and then discuss the uh, how does one have to define these covariant derivatives in order that the gauge invariance is preserved. Uh, and the next question it was, how does it change the dyna dynamics? So, uh, so it doesn't change uh, the dynamics in a continuum, as you can see here, because it's multiplied with the lattice spacing here. So it's, a, uh, it's an irre irrelevant uh, operator, which will be removed as I mean, it's a fact will be removed as the continuum limit will be taken. But um, it, does change, it does change the properties of our uh, discretized theory with respect to the, uh, to, the, to the continuum theory. But as I said, I mean, just by uh, breaking uh, Fully breaking, breaking full translational invariance. We already bro broken the full rotational invariance. So now, by by introducing this term, we've also broken chiral symmetry on the lattice. Uh, but uh, as we take the continuum limit, we can uh, we can safely recover it. It's just. Uh, add some additional complication into the renormalization procedure in this case. Uh, so if we are using Wilson fermions in order to simulate our QCD action, uh, it turns out that, uh, so since the chiral symmetry is broken, uh, we are not protected from the chiral corrections and uh, from, the, from the quantum corrections and due to this chiral symmetry breaking. And then uh, in this case, this Wilson, so using the Wilson discretization to, to, to simulate the fermionic part of the QCD, we must uh, fine tune the parameters. Uh, so the bare parameters of the action because uh, due to the fact that we've broken the, the chiral symmetry, uh, in, uh, we get the add add additive renormalization to our fermion mass. And we've seen that in the, in the chiral limit, uh, fermions are muscles. So in order to recover uh, chiral symmetry, we have to deal with some fine tuning of the parameters while, uh, while simulating uh, using this discretization. So there are alternative discretizations, and I'll only name a few, and each of them has uh, some advantages and some disadvantages, similar as in the case of Wilson fermions. And uh, for example, uh, I just staggered fermions. They were the first to appear uh, right after Wilson fermions. Then, uh, then you have uh, fermion. Fer so you have some discretizations uh, which preserve not fully chiral symmetry, but preserve a chiral symmetry on the lattice. They go under the name of overlap fermions <laughs> and so on. Uh, so the fact that this chiral symmetry, that we had to give up chiral symmetry in, uh, in the case of uh, solving the problem of uh, doublers of the, on the lattice is not accidental. And uh, it turns out that this uh, existence of the doublers and the explicit chiral symmetry on the lattice is related in some such way, in, in some subtle way, and uh, this has been formulated already in 1981 by Holger Nielsen 
and Masoninomia and this goes under the name of Nielsen Ninomia no go theorem. which tells us, in principle, that uh, the following properties cannot hold simultaneous, simultaneously on the lattice for fermions at least in four dimensions. So the, the theorem the no-go theorem, theorem by Nielsen and Nehemiah tells us that the following properties cannot hold simultaneously for lattice fermions in four dimensions. So there are four of them. The first one is the locality. So basically that the uh, propagator is an analytic function of momenta. And then uh, and periodic with uh, 2 pi over a. Then that we have a well-defined continuum limit. Which is obviously a necessary thing in order to be able to recover our uh, physics in the continuum. Then the third property is that there are no fermion doublers. So this means that the propagator in momentum space should be invertible for all momenta which are not equal to zero. So there are no additional poles in the complex plane. And uh, the fourth uh, and final property, which does not go, go along with the all three previous ones is the continuum version of chiral symmetry. And by that, I mean that the zero cooperator and the gamma five commute. Uh, explicitly. So uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the proof of this theorem, but uh, we'll just note that, for example, so each of the currently known fermion formulations, uh, if we are working with four dimensional lattice uh, discretization of the, of the fermion action, then, for example, in the case of Wilson fermions, as you've seen, we had to give up the, the continuum chiral symmetry. And, uh, and then these first three properties were fulfilled. So we, we, are, we have, we're working with local fermion action. The continuum limit can safely be taken. And as you've seen previously, there are no doublers. Uh, in the case of... Uh, uh, so there is a way, actually, uh, so in the case of uh, staggered fermions, for example, both of these properties are slightly altered. 
and it's better than having 16 doublers, but in this case, so one has uh, an additional U1 symmetry, but uh, has, uh, uh, so but fermions come in four copies instead of in a single copy. And uh, there is a particularly exciting uh, way to realize all of these four properties almost fully. And this is by uh, uh, basically constructing fermions which uh, fulfill these first three properties and in addition uh, satisfy a version of the lattice uh, chiral symmetry which goes under the name of Gins Ginsburg-Wilson relation where uh, on the right hand side here one just has the term proportional to the lattice spacing A. So the chiral symmetry is not entirely, uh, is not entirely, uh, so it's not realized explicitly, but one recovers chiral symmetry in the continuum limit. And uh, with this, I will move to the discussion of the discretization of the gauge action on the lattice. Are there any questions so far? Yes? Uh, sorry, maybe I missed, I missed that. The, um, the what are the, um, the overlap fermions in this? What are the advantage of the overlap fermions in this, in the framework, in the framework of this theorem? What, what is not holding there? Uh, so, uh, for overlap fermions, so the first three are holding, but for overlap fermions actually satisfying this, uh, so the solution to this lattice uh, chiral symmetry uh, condition. Okay. So, uh, so their, their chiral properties are much better than the discretizations such as Wilson fermions where the chiral symmetry is explicitly bro broken. But, um, uh, but there, as you will see if you go into a little bit more details, uh, I mean, there's their simulation, uh, their inf practical implementation is much more uh, expensive computationally. So they are used in some physics applications, but they are not uh, uh, mainstream uh, lattice QCD exploration technique yet there might become a bit more computational resources and better algorithms as well. But theoretically, they're very interesting. And uh, so I yes. So what, what do you mean by locality? I mean, I if you're discrete, you will always need to somehow have a derivative to the next lattice point, no? So exactly. So, it's, uh, so, it's, uh, so locality up to the period of 2 pi over a. So basically, uh, so so what I mean by locality here is that uh, this uh, propagator in momentum space is an analytic function of p mu of the momenta with some period 2 pi over a. So it's within the single Brillouin zone. Um, all right, and now a couple of words about the gauge fields on the lattice. The situation here is slightly simpler than the situation for the fermions uh, and but the motivation to actually introduce the gauge fields in a way in which one uh, does introduce them can actually already be seen by going back to the fermion action. So we had yesterday the free fermion action and now we're going to see how to introduce the interaction. So. of x. So 
if you consider local gauge transformations, we can see uh, so we can see very easily that this action is uh, invariant under global gauge transformations, even after discretizing our uh, our covariant derivative. However, so first of all, if we turn on the interaction, so right, our covariant derivative such that they include the gauge field. Uh, then, and we discretize the continuum uh, derivative. We've seen that we need to use nearest neighbor differences. Uh, so the, mm, differences of the, so the, when we apply the, the uh, discrete version of the lattice derivative on our fields, psi of x, psi of x plus mu times unit vector. So mu, uh, sorry, mu hat times a, so the lattice facing a times the unit vector if we denote this direction as mu. And then, uh, then we somehow have to make sense between comparing uh, the gauge potential at these two distinct lattice points. And uh, we do that in a similar way as if you have studied general relativity you've seen that it's done there. So basically, instead of working with the uh, fields, actual gauge fields as mu, which are elements, as we've discussed earlier, of the SU3 algebra, uh, we will work with the elements of the gauge group. So we will have to exponentiate our algebra element. And <coughs> go, so construct the elements of the gauge group, SU3. And at each of the lattice points. And since covariant derivative connects these two uh, neighboring points, we are going to construct the parallel transporter between uh, these two. So the parallel transporter of the uh, gauge field between these two neighboring points. And uh, why do we actually have to do that? So the reason to do that is can be seen very easily if we actually write this uh, lattice version of the derivative. And uh, or even before that, we can just look at the transformation of the gauge field. So the continuum transformation uh, so if we look at the gauge transformation of the field A mu, we will get that it transforms if uh, omega is again some group element uh, defining our gauge transformation. Since we are working with non-abelian gauge theories, so we have uh, omega gauge field omega inverse plus omega of x d mu omega of x inverse. So in this case, the covariant derivative 
transforms in a similar way. So the covariant derivative d mu of x acting on psi of x after the gauge transformation, we will get d mu prime of x acting on psi of x, which would just be the group element omega of x acting on the previous covariant derivative. So when we discretize these covariant derivatives and look at this, what happens after the gauge transformation, we will get something which is even in the free fermion action, which is clearly not uh, gauge invariant. So we will get terms, so when we look into finite differences, which are defined as the value at the point x plus mu hat times a minus the value of the point, value of the field at the point 5x divided by a. So we will get terms, so after discretizing the mu of x, we will get terms which look like this. So psi bar of x, gamma mu psi of x plus a times mu hat, and so on. So our Dirac operator will, will couple the points at two neighboring fields. And it's clear already that if we perform the gauge transformation, this is not invariant under the gauge transformation because so this first term, so matter fields transforms in the same way as the covariant derivative. So we will have omega at the point x inverse, then gamma mu, and then the, uh, the right-hand side fermions transform as x, as the group transformation at the point x plus a plus mu hat times the value of the field at the neighboring lattice point. So this is not invariant under local gauge transformation. And this is the main reason to introduce gauge fields in the following way. So instead of just working with the elements of SU3 algebra, we will work with the path ordered exponentials along the links connecting to uh, neighboring lattice sites. So in the exponential, we will have the elements of the, of the uh, SU3 algebra, so i times gauge coupling times the integral from x to x plus a plus mu hat. So we will parallelly transport the field from this point to the neighboring point x plus a times unit vector mu hat. Integral over the coordinate in the, the spatial coordinate in mu direction of the gauge field here. And this, uh, since we're working with uh, non-abelian theories, the order of these exponentials is important. So the order in the integration, so that's why we are using this path ordered exponential. And we will call this as a variable u which will denote the uh, gauge group element associated uh, to the gauge link, associated to the gauge field along this 
link connecting two neighboring points x and x plus mu times a. So our fundamental variables from being uh, from from fundamental variables being uh, gauge uh, fields in SU3 algebra now become end of uh, fermionic fields psi of x. So on the lattice, we're working with again uh, fermionic fields psi of psi of x, but uh, instead of the usual gauge variables in the continuum, we will work with these elements of the SU3 uh, group constructed in such a way. And it's easy to check now that, uh, that this introduction of these link variables actually uh, helps, uh, actually makes uh, uh, the fermion action already uh, gauge invariant, even if we turn on the interaction. So um, I call these variables links, and I will do this towards the end of this lecture, probably uh, even subconsciously. And we call them links because they define um, uh, because de they define uh, they are defined along the links connecting the two neighboring lattice sites. So you can call them either gauge fields or sometimes gauge links. So once again, a mu are elements of SU3 algebra, and u mu uh, gauge links are elements of the SU3 group. Uh, so u mu of x defined in such a way, then instead of this transformation here, if we perform a gauge transformation of the link, it transforms in a rather simple way. So we have the group transformation times the gauge link times the group transformation in the neighboring lattice point. So a time u hat inverse. And this, when plugged in back into the fermion action, uh, before that, we also have to define the lattice version of the covariant derivatives. So the covariant derivatives now, not for the free theory, but when we've turned on the interaction, then are defined in the following way. So it's again uh, a form of nearest neighbor differences, except that now we also have these gauge links featuring. So u mu of x multiplies the value of the field in the neighboring point in order to be able to compare it with the value of the field in the original point psi of x minus psi of x. So this is the forward derivative. And the backward derivative is defined in a similar way. So 1 over a. So this now involves the hopping between the point psi of x and the nearest neighbor in the negative mu direction, which would be this point here, psi of x minus mu hat times a. Since I've chosen the lattice at the boundary, we've said that in practice we impose periodic boundary conditions, and this would point us to this point here, in case we have periodic boundary conditions. So we will have psi of x minus u mu dagger x minus 
a mu hat times the value of the field also in the neighboring point in the negative mu direction. And if you perform the exercise of plugging these two derivatives back into the discretized version of the fermion action, which we had earlier, uh, we can see that after performing gauge transformation, we get the uh, invariant fermion action in this case. So yes. That mu in the links is an index. So I mean, it seems that in yeah. your definition you are contracting the indexes of dx mu and a mu. But then it gets an index, no? Yeah, because it's defined along because there is also an index in the path. So it's defined mm -hmm. along the, the link. Mm -hmm. So each lattice point will now have four different uh, links associated to it for each direction along, along which this integration is performed. There's no summation over mu. Yeah. Right. There is no summation over mu in the exponential, yeah. So uh, since there is no summation. Okay. Yes. Uh, the first line should not be the mu mu of x plus a mu hat. Uh, no. Uh, and precisely uh, that's why we have this dagger here. So. Uh, so if this is, let me draw this again. So so this is, if this is acting on field psi x, it's going to take the field of psi x parallel transporter u mu of x is defined along this link. So it's going to transport it from x to x plus mu hat in order to be able to compare it with the uh, point x plus a plus mu hat. And uh, the reason why we have the same index here is because we are actually taking the link in the opposite uh, direction. That's why the dagger here. So uh, the dagger tells you that you are transporting from, in this other case, for the covariant derivative. So you're starting from x, and this is x minus a plus a times mu hat. So uh, the link is defined along the positive mu direction. So this would be u mu of x minus a mu hat, which transports you from x minus a mu hat to x. But since we're taking the dagger, this means we're actually taking the link in the opposite direction. And it's acting on the field x, moving you to x minus a times uh, mu hat in order to be able to compare with the field at x mu hat. So it's, it takes a little bit of time to, to get adjusted to, to these gauge links, but uh, usually graphical representation helps if you want to get into this. All right. So, uh, and then the simplest way to build the gauge action from these uh, gauge links so, so lattice gauge action would be uh, the following. So we can construct gauge invariant operators from these link variables. And it turns out that uh, if you take any closed loop, 
So if you take the product of links along any closed loop on the lattice, say like this, this is a way to construct a gauge invariant operator because this integration uh, along the link variables will give us uh, <coughs> gauge invariant uh, property in the uh, gauge, gauge invariant object in the end. And the simplest uh, gauge invariant object made of links is a product of gauge links along the elementary plaquette. So if we just take the elementary square and take the product of gauge links along this uh, along this elementary plaquette and take the trace of this product. This will give us, uh, so, th so the trace of this product along the, closed loop, along the closed loop will actually give us the gauge invariant uh, operator. So in this case, if we just name these links u1, u2, u3, u4, not to mess with the gauge indexes anymore, so this would be u u1 would be u mu starting from point x. This would be, if, denote, if we denote this direction with nu, this u2 would be u nu in the point, defining the point x plus a plus mu, uh, plus mu hat, yes, yeah, so starting from this point, which is shifted from point x in the mu direction, and then the uh, link variable is pointing in the new direction, and so on. This u3 would be equal to the gauge link starting from the, this point here, x plus new plus new hat plus a, but since it's pointing in the opposite direction, uh, this would be u dagger defined in this point, and similarly in this point here, this link u4 would be u defined in the point of x in the direction nu, but pointing in the opposite direction. So the simplest gauge invariant object would be the product of these links, u1, u2, u3, u4, and then taking the trace. And we will call this object a plaquette. It's defined with the two directions in which, so both these indices mu and nu can go from one to four, all four Euclidean directions, and is defined by this leftmost point and lowest left corner x. And if we write down product of these links along the closed path, uh, so this would be u mu in the point, so starting from x, the link in the mu direction, then connecting to that one would be the link in the new direction starting in the point x plus a times mu hat. Then connecting to that would be u in the mu direction, but in the negative direction of the mu axis, so uh, of the, of the mu, uh, negative mu directions starting from the point x plus a times new hat. And then the final link would be this u4 pointing in the negative new direction. And the link starting from x. It's actually starting from here, but it's the uh, the same as the link starting from x with a dagger. And uh, so 
just the product of the links is denoted as a plaquette. And trace of these plaquettes, uh, as we said, are uh, uh, or any other closed loop on the lattice will give us gauge invariant uh, operators. And the simplest way to define a gluon gluonic action on the lattice, so the gauge action, is has also been put forward by Kenneth Wilson, whom we've mentioned many times since the beginning of these lectures. And that's why it goes under the name Wilson action. Sometimes you will see an index W when this action is written down. And uh, this would involve the sum over this, uh, the sum of the traces of the gauge links along all elementary plaquettes inside the lattice. So we would have the sum over all lattice points x. We would have the sum over all planes, starting from each point. So we will denote this as mu smaller than nu, which chooses all uh, six planes, starting from each lattice side. And then we would have real part of the trace of 1 minus p mu nu of x. And this beta here, as we will see in a moment, is a factor, prefactor related to the coupling constant. And it's so chosen such that when we take the continuum limit, we uh, recover the continuum SU3 gauge action. So one can demonstrate fairly easily, but it would take some 10 minutes, perhaps, here. Uh, so we're going to skip that for the moment. Uh, that one, once taking the uh, naive continuum limit, one gets continuum young males act action starting from this Wilson's version of the discretized gauge action. So we said that this beta is related to the coupling constant, and it's defined such that in the naive continuum limit, again, 1 over gauge coupling squared equals to the beta divided by 2n. In case we are working with, with the fundamental representation of the uh, of the gauge group in case so i will put a beta f here because in case we would for example be working in the joint representation then one would have to make sure that one that this beta is chosen such that in the continuum limit 1 over g squared is recovered in the following way uh, and one can, in principle, choose an arbitrary uh, representation, as and all of them have to have have to give, and they do give uh, the same physics in the continuum limit. And after, so there, there are different ways in which one can discretize. So this is, again, the simplest way to discretize gauge action. There are ways which in involve larger uh, the sums over some extended loops, um, but again, closed loops, because we want to sum only over gauge invariant objects. And um, uh, for example, your lecturer of next week, Martin Luscher, was one of the authors of the so-called Lusher-Weiss action, which instead of uh, 
single elementary plaquettes also contains objects which combine two uh, plaquettes together in different ways. And uh, then uh, there is also the action called uh, Iwasaki action, Iwasaki gauge action, for example, which only deals with plaquettes and rectangles, while Lusher-Weiss action also has some uh, additional forms which you can, you, which you can uh, make from two plaquettes, but not necessarily in the same plane, for example, and so on. Uh, and all of these actions are a good choice as long as they are gauge invariant, and um, they just, again, bring you to the continuum limit with a different rate of convergence. So, uh, but eventually, in the continuum limit, they have to recover the young male section. And uh, after this brief discussion of the gauge fields on the lattice, we finally arrived to, the, to writing down the QCD partition function, which we will use to discuss in the last half an hour of the lecture how does one actually perform the simulations of so the, the QCD simulations and in order to do that as we as you can assume from the knowledge that you have now from scalar field theories you will have to generate the field ensemble, so you have to generate a Markov chain of these gauge configurations uh, u, u of x at each point, each lattice point. So, um, so the partition function will, since in our action we have both gauge fields and fermionic fields, in the partition function we will integrate over gauge fields and the fermionic fields, and uh, in the our Boltzmann weight will be defined with the sum of the gauge action, for example, the wheels of the gauge action, which we've discussed here, and the fermionic action, which in the full interacting case does not depend only on the psi and psi bar, but also on the Gauge, uh, gauge fields u because they enter in the covariant, in the expression for the covariant derivatives. So one has to be very careful when defining this, in particular this integration measure because we are integrating over uh, group variables and one has to define this in such a way that it's also gauge invariant, but we won't discuss this here in more detail. I'm happy to discuss this in the coffee break. And um, now uh, we will use the identity which you might have seen in your supersymmetry lectures, if you had them so far. Uh, if not, you're going to have to trust me for now that this is the case. Again, we can discuss the details of derivation in the break. But it turns out that one can integrate out these fermionic degrees of freedom and obtain an exp a closed expression of the partition function which integrates over only over the gauge degrees of freedom. The gauge action remains in the exponent defining our Boltzmann weight and uh, after integrating out this fermionic degrees of freedom one obtains just the determinant of the Dirac operator which we've shown earlier how we can uh, one way to discretize it on the lattice so this is a discrete version, for example, of the uh, Dirac operator depends on uh, both gauge and fermionic degrees of freedom. And 
if we want to generate the Markov chain of gate configurations on which we will evaluate the expectation values of the observables in the way which we've discussed, so in a similar way as we've discussed it for the gauge, uh, for the scalar field theory earlier this week. So if we would be able to generate the gauge configuration such that with the with a Boltzmann weight which is proportional to this exponent times the determinant of the Dirac operator, then we know that we can just use the relation between quantum field theory and statistical uh, and statistical physics and just evaluate this uh, average of the, on the, of the observables as one over number of configurations. I goes from one to number of configs and then evaluate the observable on each uh, gauge configuration ui. Now the question is, what's the best algorithm to uh, generate this Markov chain? Yes, please. Why don't we have to gauge fix? Okay, so as we, as, we said, as we said here, we will work only with gauge invariant observables. So if you, uh, if you prefer, you can gauge fix. There are some additional complications which you have that, but you don't have to. And this is one of the nice things of, of the whole formulation of, of lattice gauge theories. That Tell me again, sorry. If I don't put the field theory on lattice, can I just use these variables in the, in the path of your analytically? The field variables, yeah, in principle, you can define them also in the continuum so along the close. Yes, please. So the, the linked variable representation on the lattice is compact. The integration volume that you're integrating over is a bunch of compact manifolds. Therefore, you can just integrate over. You're integrating over all the gauge properties and everything. Who cares? It's all fine. If you try to do that in the continuum, then the, the spaces you're integrating over are no longer compact. And the space of gauge copies, instead of being some finite volume thing, can be infinitely extended. Um, for instance, in perturbation theory, that gives you all kinds of problems. But for instance, in, in SU2 game theory, right, you can parameterize any SU2 matrix in terms of four real numbers. I mean, SU2 is, is a sphere in four dimensions. So therefore, as you integrate over the group manifold, it is a completely finite operation. This is why it works. This is why you don't have to game fix. This is an example. Okay, I hope this satisfies your curiosity for now. Um, so, uh, so the question was how to generate this Boltzmann weight in an efficient way. So the first idea that was on the market was basically to ignore this determinant part and to consider the so-called quenched approximation where the fermion determinant is frozen, a quench to be one. Uh, in this case, we would just work with a partition function which integrates over the gauge fields 
and the Boltzmann weight proportional to the gauge uh, to the exponent of the gauge action. This is still not a trivial thing to do, but let's just note that if you want to work in this approximation, then one would not need the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm in order to, to uh, so hybrid Monte Carlo is a way too expensive uh, algorithm to generate in an efficient way these gauge configurations. You may use it, but uh, it's better to use some more efficient algorithms. However, if one does not want to quench the determinant, so um, so if then one doesn't doesn't want to work in this limit where the determinant is equal to zero, so this limit also can be considered, so this approximation can be understood as a limit in which quarks are infinitely heavy, so that there is not enough energy in the, uh, there is not enough energy to mm, create from the vac vacuum QQ bar pairs because they are infinitely heavy. And in this case, it's justified to neglect the dynamics of quarks when generating gauge configurations. But later, when you're measuring your observables, you may, in principle, uh, measure observables which do contain quarks and to distinguish betwe between the quark dynamics which has been neglected in the configuration generation and the quark field which you have in your observables, you would usually call them valence quarks. Uh, and then, if you want to include quark dynamics in your simulations, we will discuss this at a simple example. So how is this done practically? We will discuss this at a single, single example, which we will call a two-flavor theory. So we will assume that in our theory we only have up and down quark, and uh, we will additionally assume that their masses are equal, therefore the Dirac operator representing up quark will be equal to the operator representing down quark, and we will just call it D. So in this case, for the theory of two degenerate fermion flavors, our partition function would look like following. So we will go back to the case where we do have non-zero fermion determinants. Since we've integrated out the fermionic degrees of freedom, we only have the integral over the gauge degrees of freedom. Exponent minus S of u, so the gauge action is in this exponent. And we will have as part of our Boltzmann weight, both the determinant of u and the determinant of the quark. So now we have to use this uh, Boltzmann weight in our important sampling in order to generate our set of j gauge configurations ui, which satisfies this probability distribution, such that we would in the end be able to evaluate the observables on this set of configurations. And this would correspond to the physical case in which we have to degenerate uh, dynamical quarks in our QCD theory. Uh, so if we just use uh, gamma 5 hermeticity of the Dirac uh, of the Dirac uh, operator, we can, and we said that du equals to dd, we can easily rewrite this product of the determinants. So since gamma 5 d equals to d gamma 5, this means that the determinant of d dagger equals to the determinant of d, and we will use this here 
We also know that the product of the determinant is the determinant of the product. So we will rewrite this product of the determinant of the up and the down quark as the determinant of d dagger d. All right. And uh, in the next step, we will use again a well-known identity, which you might have seen. So if you've seen this integration over the Grassmannian variables in uh, supersymmetry lectures, then you've also probably seen the reverse. So the integration of the bosonic field. And now we will rewrite this determinant here as an integral over some artificially introduced bosonic fields, which we will call pseudofermions. So these are complex bosonic fields. We still have the gauge part, gauge action in the exponent as the Boltzmann weight. And now this determinant of d, d dagger, we are going to rewrite it as an integral over these bosonic fields. And in the exponent, we have minus psi dagger, the operator of which we've taken the determinant. So d dagger d, but inverse. And this is a very important distinction between this integral over fermionic and over bosonic fields. So we have inverse of this product of the two Dirac operators times the bosonic field phi. So So now, in order to generate our set of gauge field configurations, uh, so our Markov chain will have to be generated such that it satisfies this uh, probability distribution. Uh, there is a factor of pi to the power of minus n, which I've neglected here, which comes out when we rewrite this determinant as the integral over, uh, over the bosonic fields. But this can be absorbed because anyway, both the numerator and the denominator will have it in the evaluation of our observables. And now that we've rewritten the partition function of the two flavor QCD in this way, we can finally go back to the algorithm which we've applied so far to scalar fields only. So now we can write down the steps of the HMC algorithm for dynamical fermions. So I didn't discuss what was our motivation to actually do this. So, uh, so working with Grossmannian variables is particularly inconvenient in, uh, uh, in computer simulations. So we are much more used to actually working with uh, bosonic variables. So this was the reason why uh, we didn't want to keep our Grassmannian fields psi throughout the, the computation. And uh, although there have been some attempts in the past to do that, but this does not lead to efficient uh, generation of 
field configurations for the dynamical fermion case. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we will see that the algorithm which we've studied in much detail so far, the hybrid, mo uh, molec uh, hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm, <coughs> works very well for um, the simulation of these so gauge fields and bosonic fields all together. So um, the first step would be to start from this partition function and again augment it with the uh, auxiliary momenta. So in the same way as we had in the scalar field theories, we will introduce some momenta variables and we will have to integrate over them in addition to our gauge variables and our uh, bosonic fields, phi. And in the exponent, we would have e to the minus, and now again, our Hamiltonian, which is a function of the gauge fields, of the uh, auxiliary momenta, but as well the gauge fields, and our bosonic fields phi. So the Hamiltonian corresponding to the, right in the same order, so phi u phi dagger phi is again the kinetic term which has the square of the momenta these momenta correspond, as we will see in a moment, to the gauge links. So they are defined in each lattice point x and, and for each uh, direction of the link, uh, starting from the lattice point x. So we're summing over x and mu. Uh, in this kinetic term, in the hybrid Monte Carlo Hamiltonian, then we will have the gauge action, and we will have this term, which we will conveniently just denote as a pseudo fermion action. So this is not our actual fermionic action, because instead of Grassmannian variables, we are now working with, uh, with the we're now working with uh, this auxiliary fields, bosonic variables, which we've introduced just for convenience of representing the uh, fermion determinant. Again, uh, I haven't mentioned earlier, but we, we might, you could have an idea to compute this determinant explicitly in principle, and then include it in computing your Boltzmann weight. But this is vastly, vastly expensive computation. So, uh, say, if you just want to have an idea of the dimensions of this uh, fermion determinant, so you know that we have Dirac, so each, uh, each uh, component of this uh, Dirac matrix has both Dirac indices and Carler indices, then you have all the lattice, so only one, uh, so the determinant has uh, the number of rows and columns is equal to the number of sites and the lattice times 12. So basically, uh, I mean, entries in the determinant, at least if you want to uh, write it down uh, uh, each entry in on a computer. So basically, uh, if your lattice volume is L to the 4, you will have to have 12 times L to the 4 squared entries in your matrix of which you're supposed to compute the determinant afterwards. So this is a very expensive computation. If you put this L to be equal to 16, which is nowadays fairly small for the current uh, lattice simulations, which work with much larger lattices mainly, you already get to some 
600 billion entries. So the computation of a mi matrix which has so many entries is, uh, the explicit computation is, is extremely expensive. So the mot this is was the motivation to rewrite it as this Boltzmann weight and uh, use the important sampling to, to generate uh, those gauge configurations. So this last term we will just denote as a pseudo fermion action. And now we can construct the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm in the same way as we have done already for the uh, scalar fields. Uh, so we have the Hamiltonian. Uh, we have to write down our uh, molecular dynamics equations. So first, let's see what are these lattice momenta here. So the momenta in this case, as we said, so the, they're, the, they're the derivatives of SU3 group elements. Uh, the derivatives in this uh, fictitious Monte Carlo time. So since SU3, so, the, uh, so since SU3, uh, so gauge links are from the SU3 group, then these lattice momenta will be elements of the SU3 algebra. And uh, the update, so the first molecular dynamics equation will be given in a similar way as uh, we had the molecular dynamics equation for the scalar fields, except that here we have to be careful how we take the derivatives of the of the gauge fields, which are group elements. And uh, so the gauge fields are updated with respect to the following equation. And uh, the momenta are updated with respect to the Again, the differential operator uh, with respect to the link field mu. So since now we are not working with simple coordinates, uh, but we are working with uh, group elements, so we are differentiating with respect to the link defined at the point x along the direction mu of the Hamiltonian which in principle depends of the momenta, gauge group, element, phi dagger phi. But since uh, uh, the momenta are independent variables of uh, the time of the gauge group, so in principle this derivative would only be the derivative of the gauge action since this is independent on the links, plus the pseudo fermion action. And this was what we called the uh, molecular dynamics force in the scalar field simulations. And uh, the derivative of the gauge field action would is usually called as a gauge force. And the derivative of the fermion action is usually called as a fermionic force. So this would be the derivative with respect to gauge link of the pseudo fermion field y, of, of the pseudo fermion action. And once we've done that, we can write down the steps of the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm which are almost exactly the same as the steps of the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm for scalar field theories. The first step would be to genera generate the momenta variables associated to the gauge links and the difference between the scalar field theories and the gauge 
and the simulation of full lattice QCD is that here we have to also generate the save the fermion fields in the first step phi phi dagger. So the momenta are generated according to the same probability distribution as we had in the scalar fields. So the scalar product of momenta, so phi squared, basically divided by 2. In the same way uh, as we've discussed, I mean, there are some subtleties related to the fact that these are elements of the SU3 algebra. But in principle, one also uses this box Muller procedure that we've discussed earlier for the generation of scalar field variables. And the, so the fermion field is uh, generated according to the initial distribution e to the minus s pseudo fermion, where this is this pseudo fermion action. So one can do that in principle by generating some um, normally distributed field r and then drawing the field phi as an action of the, so we're acting with the Dirac operator on the field r. And then you can see that uh, if you plug this back in, so if you just uh, perform a scalar uh, product of phi and phi dagger, you would get the correct distribution related to the for the pseudo fermion fields, which is proportional to e to the minus pseudo fermion action. Mm -hmm. Then in the second step, as in the case of scalar field theories, we would solve for the molecular dynamics equations along some trajectory in Monte Carlo time from zero to tau. And these are the two molecular dynamics equations which define the update of the gauge field and the update of the momentum field in the same way as we had for the scalar field theory. And in the third step, we will again define the difference between the final Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, uh, which has the final ga gauge fields after this molecular dynamics integration or molecular dynamics integrations in the step two. So note that we are not changing the pseudo fermion fields. Along this, uh, along this integration. So the only fields that will change are the momentum. We have the momentum update and the gauge field update minus h of u1, h of p1. So the Hamiltonian at the initial field configuration and for the initial randomly generated momenta at the beginning of the trajectory. And then this uh, accept reject step is uh, implemented in a similar way as this third step that we've discussed at length for the case of the scalar field theories. So we have the probability to accept the new field configuration U2 is uh, to minimum define as minimum of 1 and e to the minus delta h defined in this way. And these are all the relevant steps of the uh, hybrid Monte Carlo. So we haven't discussed the details. Uh, how are these forces uh, computed? We've seen that uh, by using, for example, the frog integration scheme, we can uh, integrate at uh, different time scales even. We can separate, separate the uh, update of the momenta and update of the gauge fields. But in addition, uh, one can, in, in principle, uh, split this uh, fermionic, uh, split the fermionic part of the force into, uh, so split the fermionic action into some sum of uh, actions 
which each of them defines uh, a contribution to the fermionic force. So in principle, uh, one can do that and then integrate uh, uh, integrate the, so update the momenta according to the contributions of, of and in integrate actually each of these uh, fermionic forces at different time scales, uh, so with different integration steps, uh, in for example in the leapfrog integrator or some higher order integrators, and uh, this helps uh, us to obtain smaller violations at the end of the trajectory and better acceptance rate and more efficient algorithms for generating these field configurations needed in order to uh, compute expectation values of the observables in full QCD. And uh, just some final remarks, as I'm already uh, pretty much over time. So we've discussed this case here, so that basically test case, but which was uh, uh, which is still a very active field of research, but uh, uh, it gave uh, a, a lot of very interesting phenomenological results and uh, some precision measurements as well, uh, despite the fact that we've made this assumption that up and down marks, okay, up and down quarks, so be up, up and down quarks are uh, degenerate. One can, in principle, include also um, non-degenerate quark, uh, quark, uh, uh, quarks uh, uh, into the dynamical simulations. And in this case, so for example, if we would want to include a uh, strange or charm quark, uh, since their masses are vastly different, it doesn't make sense to make this approximation that up equals to, the, uh, to, to the, uh, that strange equals to charm. So in principle, one can include strange charm, in, uh, strange quark in the simulations independently. Um, and the way to do that is basically to take the, again, take another determinant of the strange quark, but then take the square root of this d dagger d. Uh, and then one approximates this square root usually with some rational or polynomial uh, approximation, and one is then able to simulate single uh, quark flavors and not necessarily this convenient case where uh, we have a square of the Dirac operator. Um, and then uh, another very interesting case and uh, unsolved problem that we've uh, so uh, that we've mentioned several times, it was mentioned uh, in, for example, Guy's lectures yesterday, uh, is the case of simulating uh, non-zero chemical potential. So QCD at non-zero chemical potential is uh, a very interesting and uh, very difficult problem that hopefully some of you will be able to solve. Um, so basically, and as you will also hear in the next weeks uh, in Claudia's talk, in Claudia's lectures, um, that uh, using this algorithm for simulating uh, QCD, we can very well, uh, so if this is a QCD diagram, we can very well cover this uh, uh, mu equal to zero axis, even for non-zero values of the temperature, and at least one of the students is also uh, doing actively research in this field. Uh, so I leave it to you to find out who that is, some uh, 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 social homework. And, um, uh, but if we want to simulate QCD along this uh, axis of, uh, with finite chemical potential, then a QCD action turns out becomes complex. And this is a consequence of the fact that um, when we extend our partition function from canonical ensemble to grand canonical ensemble, we actually uh, get a Dirac operator, which is no longer Hermit Hermitian. So the Dirac operator at final chemical potential, gamma 5, equals to the D dagger of minus mu. And as we've seen here, we've used this Hermitian property of the Dirac operator 
in so gamma five, uh, the fact that it's gamma high permission in order to be able to simulate the dagger D, uh, which allowed us to rewrite the fermion determinant with this sort of fermion action and so on. So in this case here, uh, we can still do that, but then we get a complex, uh, uh, a complex uh, probabilistic weight. And in this case, our important sampling does not make much sense if we go much further away from axis, uh, from the this axis which has uh, chemical potential zero. So you we can get by in the vicinity of uh, of mu with some reweighting techniques and so on, even with these conventional QCD algorithms. But going much further away from mu equals zero does not work with the current algorithms of the market. This is a very active field of research. There are some proposals, uh, uh, mainly in the direction based on so-called warm algorithms, or uh, you will also hear some dual uh, representations discussed in this case, but not in the notation in the sense that Andre discussed yesterday, but in the sense that one tries to find a dual representation of uh, QCD partition functions such that this important sampling can be done in an efficient way even for, uh, for non-zero values of the chemical potential because uh, this uh, dual representation is supposed to give a positive probabilistic weight. And um, uh, another very interesting uh, field and very active field of research where I'm currently working in is basically uh, not, so basic first step would be uh, uh, not to assume that up and down quark are the quarks are de degenerate, but uh, to add instead of just simulating QCD to at the same time add uh, quantum electrodynamics and treat both of uh, these theories on the lattice at the same time. So this allowed us to actually study the, the fine differences between uh, up and down, uh, up and down uh, quarks because so far in, in many lattice simulations so far they have been considered degenerate and we know that the isospin symmetry is broken in nature and that uh, by the fact that these quarks have both different charges and different masses and the fact that uh, um, the QED coupling is non-zero even though when you're simulating QCD only you assume that uh, there is no uh, that fine structure constant is actually equal to zero, which in nature we know it's not. So this is another very interesting uh, uh, field of research for your further explorations in this field. And I'll conclude here. Thank you. <laughs>